18 years ago, this month, 9-11 was the most horrific attack on America in modern history. It changed the lives of everyone in the world. I remember it like it was yesterday. And today we have award-winning journalist and historian Garrett Graff on the show to talk about his new book, The Only Plane in the Sky. It's a detailed account of the morning of 9-11 and those that lived through it and I witnessed the events that took place that day. Garrett joins us to talk openly about what he learned through the process of this book and his own story and how it changed America and the world. Hi, I'm Tony Sweet with Captain Ron. This is Truth Be Told, and we welcome to the show, Garrett Graff. 18 years ago, this month, 9-11. Garrett, how you doing, sir? Well, we are so excited to have you here. I'll tell you, I'm trying to get this unlocked here. We are excited to have you here because not only 18 years ago that this happened, but uh, uh, and many of us that were alive that uh, remembered, you know, the, the, the first accounts of, oh, it was a small prop plane that hit the, the towers. And then it changed our, all of our lives for, you know, in the world. So uh, thank you for being here. I'm excited to share your story and your journey of putting this book together. Uh, so I want I want to start by saying uh, when you started putting the book together, you start you start at the airport with, with the ticket agents, and so I want to I want to go into a little bit more details on how you put this together. How did you begin your journey of of saying I'm going to put this book together, and these are the people who are going to do it? Because it's, it, I'm sure 18 years later, many people either didn't want to share their stories or you know, are still grieving from the losses. So can you, can you start with that, how you began the book? Yeah, so this, the book, The Only Play in the Sky, grew out of an article that I wrote for Politico magazine that ran for the 15th anniversary of 9-11 in 2016. And what uh, that particular piece started with was just following President Bush through his day on 9-11. Um, I, and I interviewed 28 people who were around him that day, from the pilot of Air Force One to White House Chief of Staff Andy Card to the press uh, aboard the plane, the security, Carl Rove, Ari Fleischer, um, a lot of the Bush staffers that day. And when the piece originally published, what really struck me was the reader reaction to it. Um, and sort of two in particular really stood out in my mind. The first, was uh, a, a young mother uh, who had two children, seven and nine, and she was a veteran. And mm -hmm. she wrote that she had printed out the article and set it aside so that someday when her children were old enough to read it, she would be able to sit them down and explain to them why mommy had gone off to war. Mm -hmm. And then the second was another veteran um, who was younger, uh, he was uh, uh, an army veteran, had done three tours in Afghanistan uh, in, in Iraq, and had uh, been actually only in middle school on 9-11. And he said that he had never really understood how traumatic that day was for the country until he read my article and saw the day through President Bush's eyes. And those two reactions just really stuck with me in the in how this apocalypse event, this thing that changed the whole world, that changed our modern life in the United States, that changed our politics, changed our geopolitics, that an increasingly large percentage of the population just had no memory of it. They had no emotional connection to it. A quarter of the population today now had, was either born after 9-11 or was too young uh, right. on 9-11 to remember the day. And so my goal for turning that original article into this whole book was to try to recapture what that day was like to actually live. Because I think one of the things that stands out to me uh, as I work on this project is just how much the, the history that we tell of 9-11 does not fully capture that day. That the right. story that we tell of 9-11 is so much neater and cleaner 
than the history of the day that we actually lived, those of us who were old enough to remember it. And you were talking about it just in that intro of, you know, the confusion about when the attacks began, uh, the, the chaos, the fear, the trauma that unfolded over the course of the day. And, and, and just sort of what, uh, uh, what a mystery so much of that day was like to all of us who lived it, whether you were a school kid that day, whether you were close to one of the attacks, whether you were the president or the vice president of the United States, the, we, we just didn't understand when the attacks began. We didn't understand when the attacks were over and we didn't understand what came next. And so this history of the facts of 9-11 that we tell um, the, uh, uh, the attacks beginning at 846 in the morning with the first crash into the first tower, right. the, uh, and then ending 102 minutes later at 1029 with the collapse of the second tower. Um, that's history just sort of doesn't actually, I think, adequately capture the day as America actually lived it. So this book, the, it, the goal is to tell the totality of the American experience on 9-11 uh, through the voices of 480 Americans, morning to night, coast to coast. Well, I mean, just like you said, reliving it, and because you were old enough, I was old enough, but reliving it sometimes, it, it going back to the time before 9-11, it, it, America seemed untouchable. And, mm -hmm. and even to this day, we, most of us are thinking, when is it going to happen again? When is it going to happen again? Before, we just thought that was never going to happen. So, And I, I think that's always put us on edge as Americans now. Even though we, we are still the greatest country in the world, we still have that little edge that we fear. Um, but how did, how did you manage to gather such chilling and emotional stories that – and then transfer them to the page to, because that's that's that takes talent to be able to put that on the page to really feel the emotion behind it. How did how did you manage to get the the yeah. information? So the uh, the the book is a mix of my own original interviews and then archival oral histories uh, that I found in libraries and archives and collections across the country. So there were a number of institutions that after 9-11 had the good sense to go out and try to capture some of these stories and these memories while they were fresh. Um, the 9-11 Museum in New York, the 9-11 Tribute Center in New York, the Capitol Hill Historian, the Pentagon Historian, the Flight 93 National Memorial Story Corps actually did a big project uh, with the Library of Congress, uh, the Arlington County Public Library, a number of other places like that across the country. Um, and so the first step of this book was to go out and, and look at those original archives. Um, and those, uh, those collections uh, total about 5,000 oral histories, um, of which the researcher who was working with me on this, uh, the, we collected about 2,000 of those stories that mm -hmm. formed the foundation for this book. Um, and then I did about 200 stories that uh, I collected myself over the course of this project. And then, you know, we sort of boiled that down uh, over, you know, about a year and a half of writing and editing to the 480 voices in here, um, both stories that I did uh, and then archival oral histories as well. So the 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 people that you interviewed I, I remember hearing somebody that you interviewed or interviewed you you said they said what is your you know most telling story or one of the one that stu stuck out and i i mean it would be difficult to i guess choose one because every every person has their own their own story and their own uh take on it but is there one that did did maybe brought you in emotionally because I know as a journalist, you know, it's your job to, you know, kind of keep that neutral ground. But was there one that really stood out and, and brought you into that story uh, emotionally? Yeah. Uh, so the, this, uh, a, a theme of stories that sort of most connected with me, the ones 
that I sort of found most haunting uh, and, and stuck with me over the course of this book was the way that really luck or fate or whatever you want to call it uh, played such a monumental role in that day, determining who lived and who died, that you saw these incredibly minor uh, events in life, sort of the types of decisions that each of us makes a thousand times a day that we don't actually think about at all. Um, you know, when to run an errand, whether to stop for coffee on the way into work, uh, what elevator to get on, right. what plane to catch, what train to board. Um, and, and the way that those types of decisions really impacted that day. Um, Michael Lamonaco, who was the chef at Windows on the World, the restaurant atop the North Tower, he, uh, on a normal day, on all other days, would have been in his kitchen at 8.30 in the morning. But that day, on 9-11, he decided to stop and buy a new pair of glasses at Lens Crafters on his way into work and ultimately uh, ended up uh, missing the last elevator to the top of the tower. Wow. And 72 of his colleagues died, and he didn't. Mm -hmm. um, Joseph Lott, who was a, a computer salesman that day and was supposed to be attending a conference at Windows on the World, he was... Um, he was having breakfast at the Marriott Hotel at the base of the towers that was nestled in between the North Tower and the South Tower. And one of his colleagues at breakfast gave him a new tie um, that she'd been on vacation the week before, saw a tie that he, she thought he would like and gifted it to him. And he was so touched by the gesture that he then uh actually decided to go put it on. And so he went back to his hotel room to change his shirt and put on this new tie. And his colleagues went on to the conference and he lived and they didn't. Hmm. And it was uh, sort of those types of stories, the way that you realize that, you know, these incredibly minor decisions end up unlocking alternate futures or alternate worlds that I, I just sort of found so haunting in as I was going through these stories. Um, you know, one of the police officers in the book, you know, he says, uh, you know, it was a day of lefts and rights. And that was so literally true that day that you see these stories of, um, you know, at the Pentagon, sort of particularly people who, uh, you know, came out of a destroyed office than those who turned left died and those who turned right lived um, and just sort of those incredibly haunting stories of sort of what could have been that people never consciously decided one way or another. We hear a lot about people that were first responders and still dealing with a lot of the after effects, you know, illnesses and, and diseases from, from the dust particles or whatever that caused them to be ill. But is there was there a lot of people that you talked to that was still dealing with PTSD uh, 18 years later? Because, you know, it 18 years is 18 years, but still it's almost like yesterday. I, like I said, I can think like it was just yesterday. I couldn't imagine seeing up front and handing, you know, somebody a ticket that, you know, eventually caused this or, you know, two blocks away that was dealing with, you know, seeing the towers fall or somebody jumping out of a, a building. So of all the people, who, who do you feel that, or did they say they were still dealing with the after effects of that? Yeah, and, and um, uh, that's a big theme of a lot of the stories. Um, you know, both uh, survivor's guilt, um, you know, sort of people right. who did escape the attacks uh, and, and wondered why they did. Um, you know, PTSD issues for lots of the people involved. Um, and, and then, of course, the the physical health ailments of that day as well. Um, you know, I think one of the things that, again, we forget when we tell the history of 9-11 is that there really is no history of 9-11. That 9-11 is something that we as a nation are still living with and that many of those people who responded that day 
are still very much living with. And so, um, you know, you, you, this summer we saw the 200th death of a New York City firefighter from injuries or, or diseases stemming from 9-11. Um, and so, you know, the department that lost 343 yeah, firefighters on 9-11 uh, you know, has now lost almost two thirds that number um, in in the years since to related injuries and diseases, um, and that uh, in the Arlington County Fire Department, uh, which was the primary agency that responded to the Pentagon, um, they talk about they lost about ten percent of their department to PTSD. Uh, in the months and years afterwards, um, which is, a, you know, a stunning uh, level of, uh, of pain to see on an ongoing basis. Uh, and, and that this is going to be something that, you know, many of these people live with for the rest of their lives. Right. Um, Will Jimeno, uh, one of the police officers in the book that you follow, um, he was a Port Authority police officer and was actually buried in the collapse of the towers. So was, he and his sergeant, John McLaughlin, were actually the only two people who survived underneath the towers, uh -huh. um, who were rescued from underneath the towers. And they, uh, they were rescued that night, uh, the night of 9-11 into the morning of September 12th. And, you know, Will Jimeno is very uh, straightforward of the, about the battle that he has had uh, going forward in his life, both physically and, and mentally. And, you know, he says the day that you uh, the, the day that I beat PTSD will be the day that you put me in the ground. Mm. That's pr that's that's pretty uh, powerful. And uh, how, how did you choose? I mean, I and, and, and by the way, oh, I should add. Will Jimeno is, you know, doing wonderfully. He is, uh, you know, in, in, you know, very He's happy functioning. and healthy and has yeah. a great life and, you know, does a tremendous right. amount of good hearted, uh, you know, inspirational speaking to students in the military and inmates and addicts about sort of that journey back and sort of, you know, rebuilding his life. Right. Um, but, you know, e even as well as he is doing, he understands that this is a lifelong battle that he'll have. And how did you how did you come about the people you chose to be in the book? Was it organically or, or like, you know, so and so down the street? He you know, or how did you choose the people that you put into the book? Um, yeah, it's a good question. And, you know, part of a, a project at this size and scale is, you know, I'm sure a different historian or, or writer sitting down with the same collection of, you know, 2000 oral histories it could have written an entirely different book, never repeating a single quote that I actually chose and used myself. Um, I was lucky enough to have a, a researcher who was working with me on this, Jenny Pachuki, who had been an oral historian at the 9-11 Museum for much of the last decade. And so had actually uh, devoted a lot of time to conducting some of these interviews herself over the years mm -hmm. with her colleagues and you know really knew the story of 9-11 inside and out. And so she was an incredible guide to, uh, you know, some of the people who had the most interesting stories. Um, but beyond that, what I was trying to do uh, at the journalistic, at the historical level, was to capture the full sweep of the day. And so there are not that many people in the book that you follow start to finish the full day. You know, there are probably only two or three dozen people who follow through the whole book. Most people sort of only come uh, for the brief moment where their drama of that day intersects with the national drama. Because I'm trying to tell um, a, a very national story right. at a very human level. So uh, it, it, is, it is in some ways a very impressionistic uh, or pointillist version of the history of 9-11 um, as you sort of 
uh, go person to person uh, handing off this story as it unfolds around the country over the course of that day. I, I, truth be told, we've we've had many topics. We've you know, and we've had controversial. We've had conspiracy. We've had all. And I'm not going to get too into the cons- conspiracy, but of the people that you talked to, were there any that you talked to that saw it differently? <laughs> Maybe a little conspiracy of something that they saw that they did not that you did not even want to put in your in in the book that you just didn't feel comfortable with because uh, we you you know in 18 years we've heard a whole gamut of of different stories so is there some stories that you didn't put in a book because it was too controversial or even too conspiracy yeah uh, um uh, uh, so the 911 commission you know has done a very good job uh putting together the facts of that day. I mean, right. their report is sort of as thorough a debunking of most of the conspiracy theories as you will find. So right. I didn't feel a big need to, uh, you know, retrod much of that ground or, or, or to sort of get into a lot of that. Right. I, I will say sort of one of the things that I did struggle with in terms of sort of how to... Uh, uh, how to incorporate into this book um, it, is the story of how people's faith intersected with that day. Mm. Um, it, it, you know, the um, it, for all of the obvious reasons, it was a day where there were a lot of prayers uh, sent, uh, a, a lot of prayers made, mm. uh, a lot of prayers answered and a lot of prayers that weren't. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of stories from that day uh, where people's experience really hinges on, you know, uh, miracles and, and miraculous uh, escapes or miraculous uh, um, survival that, they, you know, that they attribute to a higher power, right. um, that they attribute to their own faith and their belief in God. And, it, you know, I think that one of the things that I sort of struggled with in the writing of this book was how, how do you treat something like faith um, and, and the role of something more powerful than we can understand in that day uh, because it was an important part of the experience, the lived experience of many of the people that day uh, who felt that there were higher powers guiding them out of the towers, uh, you know, that kept right. them safe uh, amid the chaos. Um, it, you know, stories of angels from that day, uh, you know, both literal and, and, and figurative um, and sort of how... How do you tell that story in a way that uh, gives agency to the people who, uh, for whom uh, that is a central tenant of how that day unfolded for them? So, so you feel and um, that the people that you interviewed, there was a theme, or was there a theme that you saw of not necessary bitterness, but more of a, a, a religion spiritual connections yes yes and you know part of part of that also of course has to do with the bias of oral history right, right. which is you know you are uh by the very definition of the project uh, relying on the stories of the people who lived um and, and so you know one of the other challenges i really struggled with in this was how do you tell the stories of the people who died that day right um, either um, in their own words um, through some uh, contemporaneous recordings that we have of voicemails or, you know, the cockpit voice recorder from United Airlines Flight 93, um, you know, or, you know, telephone calls that people placed out of the, uh, the buildings when they were trapped um, or, or phone calls from the plane uh, from the hijacked planes that people placed. Um, and, and so that was, that was another one of the real challenges, which is, you know, you, I really wanted to make sure that I told the story of 
the victims of that day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and yet, uh, at the same time, you know, those people are uh, not available for oral history. And so you're sort of relying on their stories being told by others or by the evidence that they left behind. Well, I I'm uh, I was born December seventh, Pearl Harbor Day, mm. and so that was kind of the the first big attack uh, from a foreign country on on America, at least you know in our modern age. But um, do you feel, as a historian, do you feel that, or how do you feel it's changed America, uh, even the world, but mostly specifically to America? How, do you feel like? it's grown us together or do you feel like it's actually divided us in some ways too because it seems like religion also even we talked about religion how everybody was praying but also how it separated you know the muslims and the christians and do you feel like it's helped bring us together or in some ways divided us Uh, well certainly you know the in the short term, you saw this unbelievable unity across the country right. uh, and, and really around the world um, after 9-11. Um, you know, w- most people don't realize that the only time in its history that NATO has invoked Article 5, which is the sort of mutual defense uh, clause of the treaty, was to come to the aid of the United States in the wake of 9-11. Right. Um, and, and that there was just such unity at home and abroad in the time thereafter. The decisions that our nation made after 9-11, though, um, I think are, are sort of very clearly, uh, in, in many ways, the root causes of the division yeah. that we now see in our politics and our international geopolitics. And and that I think part of my goal with this book was to really try to capture that emotion that the country experienced on 9-11, the fear, the chaos, the trauma, the confusion, because when our leaders reacted after 9-11, when our country reacted after 9-11, we were reacting to the emotion as much as we were reacting to the facts of that day. And so as we sort of hand this world off to a new generation of Americans who have no emotional understanding of that day, uh, I I think it becomes harder for them to understand the world in which they live because they look around and they sort of see a country affected and and still wrestling with the the challenges wrought by 9-11 uh, at a scale much larger than should be accounted for the facts of that day alone. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's always hard to tell when y- you are seeing an apocalypse event right. um, you know, like Pearl Harbor or uh, 9-11 slip from memory to history. But this year, the 18th anniversary, I think you can make a good argument that that's beginning to happen. Right. That you know, you have the first college students arriving on campuses across the country born after 9-11. Uh, you have the first uh, recruits of the New York City Fire Department applying to join the fire service born after the attacks. And we, for the first time this year, are now deploying American servicemen and women for the first time in American history to fight in a war uh, in two wars, really, that are older than they are. Um, and that that's, you know, an incredible moment for us as a country, a milestone for our country uh, as we pass it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's, um, I, I, I do remember I lived in uh, Kansas City at the time and where, where many people, uh, I worked at a doctor's office at the time. And uh, one of my, the doctors that worked there, he was from Pakistan. Hmm. And originally, and he, he would just get bombarded with cars driving by, calling him names, you know, go back to your country. That And he was born here. I mean, he was, his family was originally from there, but he was born here. And it, it that's why I said it, it, I feel like it, it did bring us together that uh, for a few days. And then when the real realization of who did it, why they did it, I, I felt like that really you know, kind of separated us. So, but I think this book though, 
does bring a lot of uh, uh, us together because we get to hear from how many people were in the book total? 480. Yeah. And, and every single one of those 480, I'm sure, you know, they had their stories, you know, they, they had to pick the pieces up and, and, and live their lives and try to just go on. But, you know, just because you didn't lose somebody that day doesn't mean you weren't affected. And I think, I think this book, and, and, and that's maybe my next question is what, what did you write this book to accomplish? What did you want it to do? Yeah. And I think for me, the, the goal was to capture the way that 9-11 was actually lived um, and, and to make sure that we as a country don't forget what the experience of 9-11 is uh, when we try to tell the history of 9-11. Because if you boil it down to just to the facts of the day, just sort of that neat and clean history that I was right. talking about, um, it, you really will never understand 9-11. Right. Yeah, I, uh, like I said, it just I was looking at your stuff earlier, and like I said, it did give me that little anxiety of, of – because uh, every time you think about it, how many people were lost and how it affected us all. But um, uh, in the, in a lot of the, you know, there was four different locations, Pennsylvania, the um, two towers, and then, of course, the Pentagon. And how did you have get access to people at the Pentagon? Were some still working there? Uh, did you have to get uh, authorization to get, you know, their accounts? Or, or, or was there any, you know, uh, pushback of, of putting this book together or no? Uh, so the Pentagon, I did rely a lot on the Pentagon Historian's Office oh, uh, and the archival project that they had done, uh, in part because actually the Pentagon has been a real challenge for historians to recreate that story, not because the Pentagon itself is is in any way trying to stonewall it, because but by the nature of the work at the Pentagon, sort of people rotate in and out. And right. so, uh, you know, if, if you were trying, you know, if, if you were trying to tell the story of Shanksville, uh, a lot of the people who were involved in the Shanksville story are still in and around Shanksville. Um, if you are trying to tell the story of the Pentagon now, um, you know, that, that those personnel are scattered all over the country uh, and, and actually scattered very quickly after 9-11 because, you know, most people stay at the Pentagon for a year or two. Um, so, it, you know, it's just been very, very hard for historians to recapture a lot of the story from inside the Pentagon. Um, whereas, uh, you know, there have been uh, great works done by people like the Arlington County Public Library to capture the story of Arlington and the first responders who uh, worked at the Pentagon. Um, and the, there's one uh, really good book on the battle to save the Pentagon on 9-11 called Firefight by, uh, um, by two journalists uh, that is uh, sort of an invaluable guide to how that day unfolded. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, and wh- what what was your recount uh, of the of your own story of where were you at and what what did you witness? Um, maybe not in New York, but what did you witness when you saw the first uh, tower fall or the first hit of the tower? Yeah, I, I have an incredibly boring 9-11 story, which <laughs> was that I was uh, having breakfast in college, uh, you know, sitting in my dining hall. Uh, when I first learned of the two crashes and that uh, despite that being a very boring story, it it is still very burned into my mind and the memory is very vivid. Um, And I remember a a great deal of detail about that day and how it unfolded. Um, And I think in many ways, uh, you know, part of what makes this day so resonant to so many of us across the country is that many of us had very similar experiences that day watching 9-11 unfold on television. I mean, in in many ways, 9-11 was the first global catastrophe that the world has really ever seen. That, you know, we watched so much of that day unfold live 
on TVs across the country, uh, even if you were really far away physically from uh, New York, the Pentagon, or Shanksville. Yeah, I uh, like I said, it, it, it uh, it's a powerful book. I hope everybody will you know get out there and and pick it up. I'm sure you can pick it up at all the you know Amazons and the bookstores. But uh, the only plane in the sky, an oral history of 9/11. But this is not the only book that um, Garrett has uh, you know thrown out there for us to 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 enjoy. I, I want to touch on this. I hope you don't mind us doing a switch because we only have about 15 minutes left. And I, I want to I want to talk about the threat matrix, the FBI at war. If you don't mind if, uh, touching on that a little bit, could you? I mean this this was a this is a big deal. I mean I lo- I, I'm a hi- I, I love history. I don't get it in detail like you, but I, I'm just a big history buff. And when I saw this, I said we have to talk about it. So talk about the threat matrix and and how you put this together and what it's about. Yeah, uh, so uh, I've covered uh, national security uh, and technology for most of the last dozen years as a journalist. Um, and, and one of the things that actually you know makes the this book only plain in the sky somewhat inevitable, uh, perhaps, is that nine eleven is a major hinge in almost every story that I've written about over right. the course of my career. Um, you know, the rise of the FBI's counterterrorism mission, the rise of the Department of Homeland Security, right. um, you know, the rise of the surveillance state, um, you know, everything having to do with Edward Snowden is effectively a, a story about 9-11. Um, and of course, uh, the, you know, the rise of customs and border protection and the border patrol and the border crisis that the U.S. is in right now, that uh, is a big part of the day-to-day journalism that I do, uh, it is really a 9-11 story at its core as well. Um, and so th- this Threat Matrix book, um, which came out uh, in 2010, was in some ways uh, my first foray into this space. And it's sort of, uh, in in many ways, all of the story that is not told in The Only Plane in the Sky. So Mm -hmm. the book, uh, you know, begins before 9-11 with the rise of international terrorism and continues after uh, 9-11 and and really is the story of Robert Mueller's time as FBI director. He's sort of the main character in that book. He took over, of course, on September 4th, 2001, one week before 9-11, mm-hmm. and thought he was showing up to like fix the computer system, <laughs> um, which was the FBI's major problem at the time. And of course, a week later, ends up you know leading the FBI in the wake of 9-11 through this wrenching transformation from a domestic law enforcement agency into an international intelligence agency. And so, um, you know, that whole story is what I trace in the threat matrix, um, effectively beginning with one of the first violent hijackings that the U.S. ever experienced, the hijacking of Southern Airways Flight 49 in November 1972 and continuing up through the Times Square bombing in 2010. Yeah, I, I, uh, this, this is one of the subjects that I, I love to talk about. And it, doing your research, I mean, because Robert, Robert Mueller, of course, in the last few years have gotten, you know, wasn't he kind of pretty much retired and they, they kind of brought him back and out of retirement? I'm sure sometimes he probably wish he, he would have just stayed home. But uh, was there a time that you, when you started doing your research of this book, where you're like, man, this, there's some crazy stuff going on that we just don't know about. I mean, that you even were, maybe even got nervous about. Because like I said, truth be told, we touch on everything. We've had, yeah. we've had Roger Stone on. We've had all kinds of people on. But we, 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 we like to hear it both sides, and we want to really uh, get the truth out to the people because people want to be told the truth. And a lot yeah. of people don't believe that they're being told the truth. But when you're doing your research, is there anything that you feel that there's some scary stuff out there that we should know, but we don't? Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll answer that question in, in sort of two parts. You got it. The, the first is, um, you know, I think when you look at 9-11, part of what is so what was so confusing to us that day 
was the fact that Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden were such a mystery to us as Americans. Um, right. And, uh, you know, I, I remember that day being so confused about this picture of Osama bin Laden on the TV, where sort of everyone on TV seemed so sure that this was the guy who had attacked us. And I just couldn't understand sort of how or why, because I had never heard of him. Yeah, and same here. <laughs> I'd never heard of this Al Qaeda group. And so, you know, in many ways, 9-11 was sort of America waking up to the fact that it was already in the middle of a movie that it didn't know was playing, that, um, you know, Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda had been on the rise for a number of years and the, the data points were there. I mean, the bombing of, uh, in 1998 of the embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, the bombing in 2000 of the USS Cole. Um, and yet, you know, until they struck the homeland, we sort of didn't really understand, uh, I, I think as a country, what a threat Al Qaeda posed. And, and so a big part of that threat matrix books ends up being sort of trying to tell that early bit of the story and how, um, you know, the FBI had responded both before and since. Um, and then to sort of fast forward to the second part of the answer um, and, and sort of be thinking about, you know, what are, you know, what is the story that we are not paying attention to right now right. as a threat? Um, you know, to me, a lot of my day-to-day -day journalism and day-to-day -day work involves cybersecurity now. Um, and you know, 9-11 at its core was a failure of imagination on, uh, on behalf of the nation, you know, that we had not imagined the uh, planes ever being used as missiles. Right. Um, and so that was a threat that we were very unprepared for. And in the cyberspace, one of the things that we really do see very consistently is those same failures of imagination that, um, you know, when Iran first struck the United States, they attacked Sheldon Adelson's casino in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, um, which was on nobody's list of one of the most critical targets uh, to defend in the United States. Um, you know, when North Korea first attacked the United States, um, they, they came after Seth Rogen's stoner picture uh, the interview by attacking Sony Pictures Entertainment, which was, again, not on anyone's radar as a place that we needed to be defending, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we were very unprepared for the idea of having to basically defend free speech against foreign nation states, um, because that's really what the Sony Pictures Entertainment right. attack was about, was whether... Uh, no matter how bad the the movie actually is. Um, <laughs> and if you talk to government officials, they will say sort of the greatest crime that North Korea committed was forcing the U.S. government to have to sit down and watch Seth Rogen's movie. But if, if artists inside the United States don't feel like they can freely express themselves uh, because they will be attacked by a foreign nation... Um, you know, that has a pretty chilling effect on free speech. Um, China, uh, when it, it sort of first attacked us in a surprising way, you know, we had spent so much effort uh, uh, trying to secure Pentagon networks, the intelligence right. community needs networks. Um, and yet, you know, they surprised us by coming in and stealing uh, the U.S. government's personnel records from the Office of Personnel Management, mm -hmm. which was something that none of us we're paying attention to in terms of those, the theft of those records you know, represents one of the greatest intelligence coups in a half century. Um, you know, it'll be a generation or two before the U.S. is able to sort of fully recover from the theft of those records. Um, and then, of course, in 2016, you saw uh, the attack by Russia. And when, you know, the U.S. talks about critical infrastructure, we talk about electrical grids, we talk about water systems, we talk about hospitals, 
And the thing that we were totally unprepared for in 2016 was an attack on America's confidence in itself. Um, you know, we were uh, unprepared for an attack on sort of the foundations of our democracy and our trust in one another and as Americans. And that, that sort of turned out to be sort of the soft underbelly of uh, American democracy uh, in, in a way that Russia understood, but that we had never understood ourselves. <laughs> um, and, and so when you sort of look at that pattern, um, it, you know, it's clear that we can still sort of suffer uh, from those failures of imagination like 9-11. And in, in, in some ways, I think the, the most likely next failure of imagination, which is always something that's hard to predict, because by its very nature, you are sort of predicting the thing that you aren't thinking about. Um, but, I, you know, I think we're likely to see over the next couple of years attacks on data assurance and data integrity hmm. that will sort of undermine uh, or could undermine you know, our, our economy, our bank accounts, stock markets, hospitals, medical data, you know, sort of if so much of our modern world is buried in computer databases, right. that we sort of assume that we can trust uh, that at some point, if we suddenly show, if an adversary is able to show that we can't actually trust that data anymore, um, you know, that'll be a huge issue for us to work through. Well, I, I, I mean, this is so fascinating or, you know, we're almost out of time. We're only a couple minutes left and I maybe, you know, down the future, we'll have to have you back. But do you feel that, so the biggest, do you think the biggest threat for America in the future is mostly cyber? And then, because I, I, I've always thought about this. It's, I mean, it's pretty easy to, to attack, you know, our grids, our, you know, nuclear power plants. I mean, it's, even though there, there's facilities that are, you know, are guarded, but, you know, most of us can drive right up to most of these facilities. Um, but do you feel like um, America since 9-11 is safer? Or do you feel like we're still very vulnerable right now? Um, well, so both are true, right? Um, you know, we... It, every day, uh, we are both becoming more secure in cyberspace, right. and we are making ourselves more vulnerable. Right. Um, right. <laughs> and, and, you know, the, the challenge is, uh, you know, I think that we are relatively early on in that cycle, and we are probably, you know, 10 to 15 years away from being anywhere close to how secure we ultimately should be. Um and I think the thing that worries me in the cybersecurity realm is that we have seen over the last decade all of the ways that our information can turn out to be insecure. You know, that as we've digitized right. all of the information in our lives uh, and gone from analog to digital, um, just how many ways that that can be exploited by bad actors. Right. <laughs> and yet, at the same time, we're about to make and in the process of making sort of all of those same mistakes with our infrastructure um, and our stuff. Um, and that sort of the rise of the Internet of Things, which is, you know, as insecure in many ways as your, um, it, you know, as our information has been over the last decade. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that's a really huge problem. You know, it's one thing if hackers are able to, you know, lock up your computer with ransomware on your right. desktop at work. It's something else if hackers are able to, uh, you know, turn ransomware onto your refrigerator as we turn all of our appliances in our homes into smart devices. And it's something else entirely if they are able to, uh, you know, manipulate your autonomous vehicle or grandma's pacemaker. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it, uh, it, it's one thing if you show up at work one day and your computer isn't working. It's something else if you are barreling down the highway at 70 miles an hour and suddenly, uh, you know, a little message pops up on your screen saying, uh, pay $300 in Bitcoin right now to unlock your brakes. Wow. 
In fact, I just saw a commercial earlier this morning, which is kind of synchronicity there, about somebody trying to get away from the cops, and the cops say whatever the you know whatever that system on they star. yeah yeah on star turn off this car and and it the car turned off <laughs> and it, it's so it's it, that's what i think a lot of people are getting scared of it's like yes i want to be protected but how much am i giving away how much yep. freedom am i giving away and you know i hear this from pol politicians and other people like well you know if you want to be safe we start that we heard this right after 9/11. That's why I think a lot of people get into the conspiracy side of it, because it's like well, I don't know, I don't know about this. So, but I don't want to get too far into that because I know it gets a little crazy, and and we we love talking about it. But, but Garrett, thank you so much. This was so fascinating. Your uh, wealth of uh, knowledge, and uh, thank you for writing the book, The Only Plane in the Sky. You can get that pretty much anywhere, Amazon. I'm sure pretty much every bookstore. And uh, is there another book coming out soon? You, I mean, 400 and some, I mean, are you? No, just gonna, that's it for now. Yeah. For, you're like, I'm tired. I'm, I'm ready yeah. to take a break. <laughs> but thank you so much. Uh, you can go to um, uh, uh, Garrett's website, Garrett Graf. Is it Graf or Graf? Graf, yeah. Graf.com. That's two Fs, two Rs, two Ts. And uh, you can uh, check out all his upcoming events, any speaking engagements, and please uh, support him. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining Truth Be Told. We always uh, love having you in the chat room. There's some people in the chat room that are sharing their thoughts and you know, and asking questions that I wish I would have been able to get to, but uh, we ran out of time. But until next time, I'm Tony Sweet with Captain Ron. Garrett, take care of yourself. Thanks. All right.